There we go. Next up, we have Georgia Hunter. Um, so I'm really excited to welcome Georgia to the stage. Georgia is a final year PhD candidate um, in the Materials Science and Engineering Department at Monash University in Australia. Her research is working on improving the properties of composite materials by harnessing the exceptional design strategies found in nature and combining it with the exciting new technology of multi-material additive manufacturing. Um, Georgia is a huge brain. I have to say, I'm so impressed every single time I talk to her, um, what she's able to do and what she has been doing with her PhD. She's recently just um, published a, a paper. Georgia, welcome to the stage. Um, Georgia, what's the title of your paper, your latest one that was just published? Sorry, I've just lost the sound for a sec. We can um, hear you fine. Cool, great. I can hear you now again. Yeah. Um, so you can hear me fine? Perfect. Yeah. Um, thanks for that introduction, Alex. I'll just share my screen and just check yeah. that you can see that. Great. We sure can. Um, so take it away, Georgia. Georgia, what's the title of your latest paper? Where did you publish it? Um, Controlling Failure Regimes in Brick and Mortar Structures. Just came out about two weeks ago um, and it's in Extreme Mechanics Letters. So just a little plug there for that paper. Yeah, no, well done. It's a, it's a great achievement. So um, take it away, Georgia. I can't wait to hear from you. Great. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, so um, as Alex said, my name is Georgia Hunter. I'm a PhD candidate at Monash University. Um, and today I will be presenting, um, oh, my presentation is on harnessing the exceptional properties of nature via multi-material additive manufacturing. So there's this known conundrum in material science, and that is that there is this trade-off between strength and toughness in traditional materials. For example, if you think of most traditional ceramics, so something like a ceramic bowl, these require a lot of force until they start to yield. So we can't just pull or push on a ceramic bowl and cause it to break. However, once they do start to yield, then they shatter almost immediately. This means that they're strong, but they're not tough. Alternatively, if we think about our more traditional polymers, so something like a plastic bag, these don't require much force before they start yielding and stretching. So we can easily, just with our hands, cause a plastic bag to deform simply um, just by pulling it. However, they'll stretch for a very long time until they'll actually break. So plastic bags are therefore tough, but they're not strong. So this is a common trade-off in materials. They're usually either tough or strong. Ideally, however, we want our materials to have both of these properties. So we want them to be both tough and strong. One group of materials that often exhibit both high strength and high toughness are natural materials. So these are the materials that we find in nature. So a couple of examples of natural materials that exhibit both high toughness and high strength include the conch shell, the nacre, which is the um, inner surface of this abalone shell, and the dactyl clubs of a stromatopod. So that's these kind of like fist looking things at the, um, uh, on the stromatopod. So one common factor between these natural materials is that they are comprised of two or more materials of significantly differing properties. But what is particularly impressive is that the constituent materials that make up the natural materials are often very simple materials that themselves are not particularly impressive. For example, many of these natural materials are comprised of a ceramic material similar to our ceramic bowls and a polymer material, again, similar to our um, something like a plastic bag. As one specific example, nacre, which is this inner surface of this abalone shell, is comprised of a ceramic called aragonite and a polymer protein. So the toughness of these two individual materials are shown um, here. So this is our nacre protein and this is our aragonite. While the toughness of nacre is several orders of magnitude higher than either of the constituent materials. So the question is then, how do these natural materials exhibit such exceptional properties when the constituent materials that they are made out of are themselves unexceptional? So one other common feature 
between natural materials is that they have multiple levels of design. So this includes a microstructural level, a component level of design, but most uniquely, it also includes a level of design that is in between the microstructural and component level. And we call this level of design its architecture. So some SEM images of our conch shell, our abalone shell and our dactyl club show um, what this architecture level of design looks like. So it's therefore this combination of multiple materials with vastly contrasting properties into an architecture level of design that is believed to be the reason for the exceptional properties exhibited by natural materials. The fact that these materials have such exceptional properties means that there's this motivation to try and replicate the structures synthetically. But to do this, we need a tool that can create a part with multiple materials and with high spatial control of those materials. Um, and this is really difficult to achieve just without conventional manufacturing techniques. However, it has been made possible with the developments made in multi-material additive manufacturing. So additive manufacturing provides us with this tool to spatially control material placement in a part, while multi-material additive manufacturing technology allows high spatial control of multiple materials in a single part, which is what we need to create these architecture structures. So the main printer that has been used for this application is the Polyjet printer by Stratasys. So one particularly important feature of this printer is that it can print parts um, with vast materials of vastly different properties um, in a single part and with a seamless interfacial join between the different materials. Um, so just a quick side um, of how the printer works. So the way that the printing process works is that a layer of small droplets of a photo curable acrylic based resin are deposited onto a substrate. Um, and this is done via a print head that contains more than 1000 individual nozzles. And these individual nozzles are then broken up into sets so that each set can print a different material in the layer. And then once deposited, a UV light is then used to solidify the layer and the process is repeated, um, depositing each new, light, new layer of droplets onto the previous layer and then and that's creating this kind of multi-material ready object. So a couple of examples of different architectured structures that have been inspired by nature and have been manufactured with this polyjet technology are shown on the screen on the right. So one particular motive that continually appears in nature and which is easily manufactured with multi-material additive manufacturing is a brick and mortar structure. So this structure is characterized by stiff bricks, which are staggered with respect to one another and with this thin layer of soft material between the bricks. So in this structure shown on the screen, the white are the stiff bricks and the black is this soft interfacial material. And in the context of polyjet, um, the stiff bricks are made from a material we call Vera White and the soft layers are made from a material that's called Tango Black. So to demonstrate the importance of this design on the mechanical response of the structure, I have a video here of the structure being tested under uniaxial tension. So we should be able to see that um, as it's tested, the weaker mortar phase fails, um, but because the mortar phase forms this staggered path through the structure, then even after there is this first visible damage in the mortar phase, it still takes a while before the structure completely fails. So the result is that the structure has this exceptional toughness while still maintaining a relatively high strength as a result of the stiff bricks. Um, now to put this into a little bit more context, um, experimental, experimental tests have been done to compare the toughness and strength of the respective constituent materials to the toughness and strength of the brick and mortar structure. So on this right hand figure here, the constituent materials are labeled A and B are in, and are in blue in the diagram while different brick and mortar structures are in green, orange and red. So if we look specifically at the toughness and the strength, so the toughness is the far right bar graph and the strength is the second to the right bar graph, we see that the toughness, the toughness of the brick and mortar structures are significantly higher than the toughness of either of the two constituent materials. While the strength 
of the brick and mortar structures remains fairly comparable to the strongest constituent material. Another advantage of this type of structure is the large range of controllable parameters. So firstly, there are a number of geometric parameters that can be changed. So this includes our brick aspect ratio, the layer thickness and the shape of the brick. While there are also a number of material parameters that can be changed. So this includes the relative properties between the bricks and the layers, as well as the relative properties between the layers that are parallel to the loading direction. So that's these red layers in this diagram here and the layers perpendicular to the loading direction. So that's those layers in blue. So this broad range of changeable structure parameters means that there's also this broad range of possible structure properties. And the structure therefore has a highly tunable mechanical response. Now this highly tunable response is interesting because it opens up the possibility to design the structure for a predefined desired response. However, to do this, we need to have a really good understanding of how the structure parameters affect the response of the composite. So additive manufacturing makes it really quick and easy to print many different structures with these different parameters. So in our work, we have therefore used additive manufacturing to print and test brick and mortar structures with a range of different parameters to explore their effect on the mechanical response of the structure. As one example, we found that if we increase the aspect ratio of the bricks in the structure, we can increase the damage distributed through the structure prior, prior to failure. So if we look at the two images on the screen, we can see that in the structure with aspect ratio of 6.1, there are a lot of layers that have failed before the structure fully fails. While only a couple of rows of layers have failed in the structure with the aspect ratio of 2.5 before the structure fails completely. What this results in is that we have a much higher toughness in the structure with the higher aspect ratio. So that's this purple plot here. Um, yes, as we can see from that stress strain curve. So similarly, if we substitute these horizontal layers, so that's these layers going in this direction with a stronger material, um, such as our digital material DM85, then we can also increase the damage distributed through the structure prior to failure. Um, so this also results in this increase in toughness in the structure. So this purple one is out with the combination of the DM85, while the green one is just with the Tango Black Plus layers. But we don't have to limit ourselves just to rectangular brick and mortar structures. We also have the possibility to change the shape of the bricks in the structure by using additive manufacturing. So a couple of examples of different brick shapes that we have tested are shown on the screen. So if we introduce an angle to the edges of the bricks, then we can obtain this interlocking shape here, or we could also obtain this diamond shape here. So if we take one of the rectangular structures that I showed on the previous slide that is not able to distribute damage, and then we add this kind of angle to the bricks, then we can get a structure that can distribute damage. So these two here are much better at distributing damage than the rectangular shape. And the result, um, as shown in this stress strain curve, is that we can increase the toughness of the structure by adding this angle. However, to add to the complexity, if we add an angle to the edges, but then we decrease the aspect ratio of the bricks, then we return to a structure that is unable to distribute damage. So this one here and this one here have small aspect ratios and therefore aren't able to distribute damage. But the complexity doesn't just stop there. An additional advantage of additive manufacturing is that we not only have control in the planar direction, but we also have the possibility to spatially control a part in a third direction. So this opens up even more possibilities in controlling the shape of these brick and mortar structures. As an example, we can combine those previous two shapes into this kind of funky shape here. So this shape has a diamond shape on its front face, while on its back, back face, it has an interlocking shape. And we call this structure um, an osteomorphic shape. So if we take the structure with interlocking shape, so that's our diamond shape, uh, so this one here, and then a structure with a diamond shape um, and take the two sizes where they don't distribute damage prior to failure, 
and we print and test the structure with kind of the equivalent osteomorphic shape, we then get a structure that is able to distribute damage and as a result has a higher toughness. So as you can see from those past couple of slides, we can control different parameters to improve and control the properties of the brick and mortar structure. And we can easily and effectively change these properties using additive manufacturing. However, we can also see that the relationship between the structure parameters and the properties of the structure is quite complex. So comprehensively understanding how every single parameter affects the response of the structure just through experimental prototyping is quite difficult, um, not to mention time consuming and expensive. A better way to efficiently explore designs and optimize properties is the development of models that can relate structure parameters to structure properties. This, however, is more difficult than it seems, um, particularly when we start considering structures that are multi-material, that are non-planar and have three-dimensional shapes. So my PhD is specifically looking at the development of these models to better understand these structures. Um, so we've investigated the validity of the implementation of a particular model called the cohesive zone model. So this particular model is advantageous because it significantly increases the efficiency to model the structure um, by reducing the computational time required to simulate the structure. I'm not going to go into too many details about the model, um, but um, as I said, so before I had, do have a paper out that gives the details of this model. So we've used this type of material model in both a semi-analytical model and in finite element analysis. So the semi-analytical model allows us to, de to develop these analytical relations between structure parameters and properties. And an example of some of our results um, here compared to the experimental results are shown um, on that left of the screen. But the limitations with this analytical model is that it's limited to 2D structures and rectangular bricks. So for more complex shapes, we've extended the model into FEA. Um, and to demonstrate how the model works in FEA, I have a quick video here of one of our rectangular brick um, FEA simulations. So we can see it's um, being pulled to the right um, and we are getting the failure of the layers as um, the simulation progresses. An advantage of FEA is that it can also extend to model non-rectangular shapes, um, and most importantly, to model 3D structures. Um, so we have here the three brick shapes that I showed earlier on the experimental slides. So modeling of these structures in 3D has not been possible previously with constitutive modeling um, due to the high computational expense required. But by using this cohesive zone model to model the layers, then it becomes possible to model the structures in 3D. And just to give you an even better idea of how this works in FEA and 3D, I have one more set of videos to show you on our next slide. So here I have different viewpoints of the same simulation to give you an idea of what the results of the simulation look like. So this is our osteomorphic brick and mortar structure. On the left is a view to show the 3D nature of the structure so we can see it changes through the thickness um, of the um, plate. And on the right, here, this is our front face of the structure, and this is what our back face of the structure looks like. So if I run this, um, we have, again, a uniaxial tension, and you should be able to see that these layers are failing um, as the simulation progresses, and then we get failure of the shear layers to um, indicate full failure of the structure. So these preliminary results show promise that this model is an efficient way to capture the response of the structures. Um, this type of model will therefore improve our understanding of the relationship between the structure parameters and the resulting structure properties. And the model will therefore help us design structures with the best properties for a given application. But once we understand these structure property relationships with a model like this one, then the main limitation is in the manufacturing capabilities of these structures. So these limitations affect what properties we can change and therefore limit the realistic range of composite properties achievable um, when we manufacture these brick and mortar structures. So if we can therefore remove some of these limitations, we can even further push the limits of this structure to obtain um, improved properties. So this therefore leads me full circle back to additive manufacturing. 
And what are the important industry developments that would significantly expand the use and applicability of these types of architecture structures? So far, polyjet additive manufacturing technology is the predominant technology capable of manufacturing these structures. However, the range of materials printable with this test technique are obviously limited. So if we can expand the range of materials printable in multi-material additive manufacturing by developing new multi-material AM techniques, um, such as multi-material metal additive manufacturing, or really ideally, um, if we can develop a polymer ceramic multi-material additive manufacturing technique, then this will further increase the range of properties that we can realistically achieve with these architect structures. Um, and subsequently, that's going to expand the range of applications for these types of structures. Um, so there are also some promising, there are some promising multi-material um, AM techniques that are, are being developed. However, there are a couple of factors that need to be specifically considered and improved to ensure that the architecture structures can be effectively printed with this, these techniques. So the first is, is ensuring that there is a strong interfacial bond between the different materials. Um, and this is to ensure failure occurs through the soft phase and not through that interface between materials. And the second is continually improving the resolution that is achievable with the different techniques so that we can incorporate multiple levels of architecture design into the structure. So if we can, if we can continue to address and improve on these current limitations in our multi-material additive manufacturing technologies, then we can fully harness the exceptional properties possible with architecture structures. So in summary, Materials found in nature often exhibit exceptional combinations of properties due to a specific arrangement of multiple materials in an architecture level of design. Multi-material additive manufacturing has made it possible to synthetically manufacture multi-material architecture structures with designs that are similar to those that are found in nature. Experimental testing of architecture structures manufactured with additive manufacturing show exceptional toughness and strength, as well as a highly tunable um, response. Modelling provides an efficient and cheap tool to understand the relationship between structure parameter and properties, and therefore allows us to realise the best designs for a particular application. But to fully make use of these structures, we need to further improve our multi-material additive manufacturing capabilities. Um, and this includes broadening the range of materials printable in multi-material additive manufacturing, improving the strength of the interfacial bond between materials in uh, multi-material additive manufacturing, as well as continually improving the resolution possible with multi-material additive manufacturing. I'd just like to finish by um, acknowledging my three supervisors um, and obviously all the um, uh, facilities that I use to make my research into this field possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Georgia, for that fantastic and fascinating, completely fascinating talk. Um, we've got a couple of questions, so let's get straight into it. Um, this is a great one that got the, the most upvotes, and I'm not, so I'm not surprised, but uh, Mm. What are some of your favourite standout natural structures that you'd like to investigate if you had unlimited PhD time? That is a, that is a great question, a really good yeah. question. Um, so my work is mainly looking at that brick and mortar structure um, and that's because it comes up so much in nature, but that's not the only thing. There's some really cool things where spiders um, and spider webs have really exceptional toughness and strength um, because they're unique design. So that would be something really interesting um, to also look into. Um, there's also, we've mainly looked at kind of single level of architecture design. But um, kind of the next step would be then multiple levels of architecture design. So kind of brick and mortar structures within brick and mortar structures um, to see how then that um, affects the, the response. Um, that's kind of a difficulty at the moment with the current additive manufacturing capabilities because you need to have really fine resolution, but also mass, like really large um, printing capabilities. So you need to be able to print on a really fine um, scale, but then um, the parts need to be big so you can incorporate those multiple levels of design. So um, that's where improving kind of the resolution, but also being able to print large structures with fine resolution um, would really kind of advance that, that field. 
Yeah, yeah. But it's unlimited. Um, there's so many great um, natural material structures and there's heaps of um, work going into just looking at natural materials and identifying those kind of motives and then a whole other field and then taking that work to then say, well, can we, can we um, understand them and, and model them and then use them in um, applications? Yeah, yeah. There's actually a related question which I'll ask is how do you find these structures? So um, is it a matter of like searching literature to go kind of go, well, that looks fantastic. And um, yeah, yeah, it seems like there's yeah. so much out there in, in nature. How, how do you how do you start to? You yeah, know, so that's a really great question. It? So there's there's whole um, groups uh, that just focus on looking at natural materials and looking at what their design is. So there's whole research groups out there that are, that are particularly focused on just doing that. And they obviously release the papers. And then there's other groups then take those papers um, to then implement them into um, uh, so like synthetically manufacturing them. So it's kind of, there's groups all over the world that are, that are looking at particular areas and then they all kind of come together to create these, these cool structures. Yeah, um, we're actually nearly uh, out of time. And so sadly, we had a, a huge number of other questions. I'm going to just go through a couple more, though. Um, uh, I think you might have addressed this in the presentation already, already but is the yep. Greek example you are pulling across the print direction or along the print direction? Yes, it's pulling across the print direction. So um, there is less... Um, uh, variability in the material orientation properties in the polyjet printer, which makes it um, not as uh, significant what uh, direction that you print the part. But um, to keep consistency, we do always print the structure so that we end up pulling it in the direction that um, the structure is being printed. Yeah, okay. Um, and did you try using voxel mm. control to create a gradient between the different materials? Yeah, that's a, that's also a fantastic question. So this is probably comes under the banner of that first question. What would I like to do if I had unlimited time in my PhD? Mm -hmm. And kind of the next step would then to be using voxel control. So um, there's a couple of people out there starting to do voxel control in these brick and mortar structures. Um, as I said, I'm in my final year of my PhD. So maybe if I was starting my PhD next year, that would be my research topic. But hopefully someone can kind of take the work that we've done or even I'll take it through to my to a postdoc where I can then explore um, incorporating voxel design into these brick and mortar structures. Because I think that would be, yeah, a very fascinating field. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, there's still a postdoc that you can do, of course. <laughs> um, and then you need to go and set up your own research group and yeah. have lots of little PhD students. So, you know, uh, really through through other people, you can achieve these things, Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, um, next question is, have you tried organic shaped bricks for interlocking? Um, I don't know if organic, or that, can you define organic shaped bricks? I guess it's um, like irregular. Yeah, okay. Is how That's I would really interpret that. That's really interesting. So there is some studies that have gone into um, looking at variability in um, the brick shape and how that affects the response over the structure. Um, but that's definitely something. So we've just kind of um, at the moment focused on kind of these four different shapes, um, but there is so, so many things available to, to study. So this is what these models that we're developing should be able to allow us to do quickly and efficiently is to basically take any shape, put it into our FEA simulation and see how it's going to affect the response of the structure. Yeah, there was a comment along the lines of uh, triangles are better than rectangles. Um, yeah. And and I and I then I added, well, hexagons are the best of gods. <laughs> um, and then and Erin very wisely reminded us that uh, actually, you know, you start with simple shapes, of course, in this work, you know, and then progress as you yeah. showed in the in the in your presentation, as you know, you've been able to progress then from the simpler shapes to more, more complex shapes. Yeah, um, exactly. This is a really good question. Uh, are these materials recyclable uh, or reusable? That's a really great question. So the pole, I don't believe the polyjet materials are recyclable or reusable. So that would be an awesome field to then um, bring up in our multi-material additive manufacturing is can we um, develop multi-material additive manufacturing that does have reusable materials um, so that we can implement these structures into something a bit more sustainable. Um, so that that is yeah. also a great question. There's, there's so many things you can do with this research. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a very cool field to be in. 
Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Georgia, for uh, joining us. Um, I always no, thank enjoy you. listening to you talk. Um, and yeah, congratulations on your success so far. Best of luck with the, re the rest of your PhD. Um, Thanks, and, Alex. Yeah, fantastic having you on. Thanks for joining us. No worries. Thanks, Alex.